go ahead and get us started. <clears throat> I was looking for my cue, but I'm just going to start because I can't <laughs> find anybody. <laughs> can't see anybody out there. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Christina Stabe. Um, my role at the Institute is Global Finance Sector Lead. And so I am helping to develop the strategy uh, for the Institute to engage more directly with the finance sector. Um, the panel I'm hosting this afternoon is financing large scale CCUS projects. So we know that in order for CCUS to be impactful, it needs to scale. And large scale projects and hubs have the potential to capture significant volumes of CO2. But larger projects require more capital, they can be more complex, and they can have multiple proponents. So finding um, funding for these projects is turning out to be a balance of risk and return. So on our panel today, we're gonna discuss um, how, how financing for these large scale projects has evolved over the past year, what kinds of business models are working now, and thoughts on gaps that we need to close to unlock more capital. Just a reminder, we'll have Q&A at the end of this session and we're very much looking forward to your questions. So please enter them as they occur to you in Slido. So let me start uh, by welcoming our panelists. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Um, for context and to set the stage, I'd love it if each of you could please uh, briefly introduce yourself, your company, your role, and also share how your organization participates in the CCS finance space. Start with you, Jan. Happy to start. Um, I'm Jan Sherman. I'm the Chief Development Officer for CarbonVert. And, um, I, and CarbonVert is a pretty, we're a small company, but we, we took on a big challenge when we started CarbonVert to focus on high impact projects that would get carbon into ge geological storage safely. And so, um, and so when we think about financing large scale projects, you know, we actually were awarded the first offshore lease from the state of Texas with our partner Talos Energy. And we are developing with now with Talos and Chevron, um, the Bayou Bend project in Southeast Texas that is um, recently expanded to include some onshore acres. So we've got offshore storage and onshore storage in Southeast Texas, positioned between the Houston Ship Channel and Port Arthur, Texas with um, an estimated billion tons of storage potential. And so, you know, and so we are developing the project. We're in, um, you know, pre-feed on the project, but um, a company like Harmonvert, we are actually constantly working on funding the project. Uh, we do own 25% of it. And we, you know, we actively fund the project through our private investors, as well as our employees. And then we also work with large investors, public institutions, private institutions that, that want to fund these projects and you know other, other means, and we can talk about that in this discussion. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Jen. Mike? Hi, I'm Michael Brownlee. I'm a director at uh, Macquarie Group uh, in the Commodities and Global Markets Division. Uh, our division's focused on providing finance and risk management products to the, the commodities market globally, and, and within that falls uh, CCS. In terms of what we're doing within my group to support CCS, at the moment we're an equity investor uh, in a company that's seeking to, to develop projects, but we're really looking to take that forward, um, participate in more projects and, and ultimately arrange and be part of the provision of finance when it comes to construction of these projects um, down the line, but happy to follow our money through the, the, the cycle. In terms of other parts of Macquarie, there's other parts that are also supporting CCS, and we have advisory services who, who will advise on transaction structures, and we have an asset management group who's a logical long-term owner of these type of, uh, of assets. As we think about, we get them into production, who, who's going to own them for that return on capital? They're a logical owner for that long history and energy transition uh, investments and in supporting the, the overall energy transition space. Hi, I'm Jane Stricker. Uh, I'm with the Greater Houston Partnership. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the partnership, uh, we're the primary uh, Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development organization for the Houston region. And about two years ago, the partnership launched what we call the Houston Energy Transition Initiative or HETI, 
which is really about ensuring the long-term economic competitiveness of the Houston region and its energy industry through the transition to net zero. And so I work with a coalition of industry, academia, uh, public and private organizations to really ensure that we're positioning Houston well to take advantage of the opportunities of the energy transition, but also take responsibility for a lot of the decarbonization work and a lot of that transition that needs to happen along the Gulf Coast region. And so we've got about 25 member companies uh, who are well represented, many of them in this room, uh, who have made the energy transition and energy transition solutions a priority. And we have a number of different working groups to help identify and overcome the hurdles and barriers to being able to make progress across key areas like carbon capture use and storage deployment, clean hydrogen, advanced decarbonization for industrial uh, applications, and then also looking very much at the capital investment side of the energy transition and how can we in Houston uh, catalyze greater energy transition investment through our investment community and bringing more uh, industry dollars and more VC and PE funds to Houston for energy transition investment. So great to be here. Okay. All right, uh, my name is Okwi Onyedum. I'm the treasurer of our low carbon solutions business at ExxonMobil. Uh, and among other low carbon initiatives in our business, we are also a, a developer of, of large industrial scale CCS projects. Uh, we are a developer across the full value chain, so everywhere from, from capture all the way down to transportation and storage and, and sequestration. Uh, and, um, and, and as of today, on the funding side, we are funding everything on balance sheet. Uh, I think right now, we, are, um, we do regularly monitor the market and part of my role is to make sure that our projects are prepared um, as we grow, as we develop down the, the, the funding path or the, the project path that we are prepared for external financing when that time comes. Thanks. So let's start by looking back over the last 12 months because we had a panel on CCS finance last year and certainly lots of things have changed, but as we know, some things have not changed in the, in the financing space. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you see that's changed, positive and negative. Um, has the level of interest changed in terms of large scale CCS projects? Is there capital looking to invest in large scale CCS projects? And what's changed from the perspective of project developers looking to secure funding? So Mike, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Um, look, a lot has changed in the last year and a lot of uh, speakers before me have touched on it. Um, but just to reiterate the point, um, and I think it's reflected by the attendance in the room, which has probably gone up by the same ratio, the increase in 45Q has been immense. Um, in terms of the projects we look at, which tend to be somewhat smaller than the hub scale, bilateral, sequesterer, capturer, those projects were really only able to exist on spreadsheets last year at the 45Q rates. There was a lot of good intentions, people trying to value engineer them, make them more economic, but it was a real struggle. And as we all know, when you go into the real world and start actually building things, it doesn't tend to move favorably for you. So without a little bit more fat in the projects, they really just, they just were really struggling to, to make economic returns. With the new 45Q uh, enhanced rate, we're seeing routinely a number of projects with very attractive returns. And, and that is a, you know, that's something that makes us as investors, but also the investors we, we also speak to, sit up and take interest and say, okay, this is something we need to be in. Um, I think not to be, completely overlooked as well is, is the restructuring to allow direct pay is also material because whilst previously the number you know, was what the number was, you were losing a lot of that in frictional costs because of actually accessing the, the, the dollars had to go through somewhat esoteric structures. Now with direct pay, a lot more of it can come to those people who are actually taking the risks and the, and the project uh, operators. So, so I'd say that, that part of the environment has improved massively and, and, and therefore there's a lot more people you know, keen, and I speak to a number of my my peers across other banks, and they're they're asking me, okay, you guys seeing CCS projects? What what can we do? What can we work on together? So, we wouldn't want anyone in this room to think that they have a, like a, a project with a good return that can't access capital. The capital is out there, and it and it's keen to find the right opportunities. In terms of other things that have changed, I think you know, there's been a couple of small small uh, negatives in the macro environment. I think you know, interest rates going up does make infrastructure projects a little bit more difficult. We're talking about longer term financing. We're talking about potentially lower returns. That hasn't helped. But, but the, when I reflected on seeing a number of projects with attractive returns, I'm reflecting all that in there. So I think we've, we've beaten that part of the, the negative. 
So I wouldn't want to dwell too much on that. The one other thing I will, I will touch on, and I, I think it's important because it talks to the, the constancy of the, the mission here, is that macroeconomics, a lot of, lot of talk about energy security, but in none of the conversations I've had with those who are emitting CO2, those who are talking about capturing it, just general customers in the energy space, no one is seeing energy security as a, okay, well, that's a pivot away from CCS, that's a pivot away from decarbonization. It's not, decarbonization is a, is a generational challenge and these, the energy security is also a generational challenge and we may have got a little bit complacent on it for a while. But these two things can absolutely coexist together and there's no pressure that we're seeing in terms of, well, let's forget about it because we now energy security is a major worry. Thanks, Mike. Okay, what's your perspective? Yeah, no, I think one of the things that changed is the signal to noise ratio, I think, has improved uh, tremendously over the last year. I think you know, a year ago, it seemed like every other day there was another announcement uh, in the CCS space. It was, you know, uh, MOUs, LOIs, you know, acquisitions, land acquisitions, and so on. And it was hard to tease out what was a real project, what's actually going to make it to commercial operations. Um, and I think now it, it feels like almost like the pace has slowed down, but the actual quality in those projects and those announcements have, has gone up uh, tremendously. And that's encouraging to see. Um, you know, I think, and think maybe related to that, um, there's been an improvement in kind of a, in, in, uh, in the, the quality of the dialogue that we're having as well. You know, we spend a lot of time talking to, um, talking to lenders, talking to other potential partners, to customers themselves, and, and the types of questions that we get back today. Uh, are, are much improved. It's at a higher level than the questions we we're getting back a year ago. Um, I spent a lot of time at, at some of these at conferences like this, and, and uh, usually CCS is is kind of in a bucket in an other bucket at the at the wind and solar uh, conferences. Uh, you know, and, and now you're, we're seeing more teams being built out around thinking about specifically CCS and the challenges around CCS. And I think that augurs a, a healthier financing environment when that time comes. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, and I think to Oku's point that, you know, we see this enormous growth in projects under development. And so, and then it's, you know, really what's the quality of all these projects? Will they all go forward or which ones will? It becomes really difficult. And so from an investor perspective and how do we finance these projects, you know, it's still probably a lot of noise for the investors and they're having to look at a lot of projects to find the right projects. And it's not also the right projects, it's the right projects, the right team and the right timing. And so, you know, it, when I think about a year ago, you know, investors, you know, are still talking about, I want to invest in construction ready projects. And, and, and when you think about the CCS projects and you look at the Global Institute's annual report, there's still very few projects under construction. And so then as, and then when and you, you also look at the projects that are under construction are under the big companies and their balance sheets. And so they're not really available to the private investment community, but the private investment community really wants to do these projects. They really want to invest in them. And so then it's, it's up to us to, you know, help, you know, de-risk the projects. And so that's putting pressure on how do we fund them if we're not in a big company. And, and, you know, in Carbonvert, it's not from one source. It's really, you know, we have private investors, we have partners that have also invested in our projects, you know, by, you know, buying into the projects at different stages, you know, and so there's a, a, a lot of different approaches, the DOE funding, you know, um, and Bayou Bend is a great example. It's a large project. It has started with DOE funding you know, carbon vert started with private funding. And my husband wasn't excited when we we're writing checks for CCS. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but the, you know, but this, this private investment was really important. And then, and then you start to see us partner with, you know, with Chevron with a big balance sheet and Talos with big offshore capabilities. And so it's really, you're starting to see the creativity in the market to unlock and move these projects forward in a way that we can finance them. And we don't have the answers yet. You know, I think there's a lot more to come as we mature these projects, but I do know that there's the will. And as these investors start to figure out how to make these projects fit within their risk fund 
and their risk profile and their funds, then I think we'll we'll see the acceleration pace of construction projects really really take a leap. So thanks, Jane. Yeah, from at least from an economic development standpoint in Houston, just the sheer number of new companies looking to do CCUS projects and looking to, to, to come into the market, both from within the US and, and more important internationally, um, particularly after the IRA, the recognition that there's a huge opportunity to expand those businesses from the European markets into the US uh, and elsewhere. And so we're seeing more and more opportunity to connect organizations from across the country and, and from across the globe into Houston to identify potential project opportunities and, and to identify potential investment opportunities. And I think the other thing that's really changed over the, the last 12 months is, you know, a fundamental understanding, better understanding around long-term liability risk and starting to be able to think about putting financial uh, assurances beneath that and, mm -hmm. and understand what is the reality of that. And, and I think from an investment investor standpoint, understanding what the financial value of those risks are will make that investment aspect significantly easier in the long term. Still lots of unknowns that need to be addressed, uh, but I think um, starting to, to be able to put together those business models. And, and to Jan's point, the evolution of business models and creativity and putting together structured finance plans that are that are quite different. I think we're seeing it across the energy transition and across different types of projects. People fundamentally thinking differently about what that business model looks needs to look like to be successful. Yes, you, you've teed up our next question on business models very nicely. But before we go there, Jan, you mentioned DOE funding. And I just wanted to ask, um, how are we seeing that actually plugging into projects or in the outlook of future projects? Are we seeing that being impactful? Um, Oakley, do you have a thought on that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I think um, certainly the DOE funding is going to be critical. If you look at someone like the, uh, the loan program office, I think that's going to be a, a key piece of the capital puzzle for this energy transition. Um, you know, the, the team there, you know, we've spoken to, it's a first rate team. I think they're actually going to lead a lot of the commercial banks in understanding this space because they've been at it for a bit longer. Um, and so I think it's reasonable to ask. And, and I think, um, you know, Jigger Shaw asked a question at a, at a conference last month about, you know, well, where is ExxonMobil? Where is your application? Why aren't you in, in, in here yet? Um, and I, I think the answer to that is it's, it's still early. Um, you know, I think our, our focus right now at this stage of, of the business is, is really developing uh, our projects uh, commercially, uh, technically, and getting them to a place where they are, they are finance ready and they're, they're kind of in, unimpeachable from a financing standpoint. Um, so we're out signing um, definitive agreements with our customers, you know, with real consequences if we fail to perform on schedule. Uh, that's been a priority. We are... Um, we, are, we are advancing the projects themselves, so securing, developing poor space, uh, you know, uh, applying for permits, uh, you know, and going into feed uh, on our projects, uh, and, and all of that, like I mentioned earlier, is still happening uh, on, on balance sheet today. Um, you know, I, I do think that, you know, as again, as, as we move on further, we're going to look to, to the LPO probably first, um, you know, to, to, to kind of help us with the external financing and to help bring in some of those private investors who want to be involved, uh, you know, but, but aren't quite ready or don't quite understand it as well. So we'll look to the, to the LPO, to the DOE to help support that, that understanding of the project uh, and, and move those financings forward. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to expand on DOE, what you're saying in terms of engagement with projects? I mean, I think the, the one thing that we all have to admit is that every project in the United States has already benefited from DOE funding. I mean, there, you know, for the last 30 years, and so any project that any of us is bragging about, it started with that. And so, you know, hats off to the DOE for, for that vision and that commitment when the rest of us were just trying to produce as much oil as we could, you know, and so, so really that's important. And I think that you know, the DOE funding has a continued role in, in the right projects. Um, and, you know, and there are some projects that we need to just get on with and get, because we need, you know, low cost projects, low cost, we need storage and we need it soon. And we need it to be able to grow as the capture, captured emissions become available. And so, you know, so it, these large projects are probably gonna be phased um, you know, but, but I think that if all the projects that we're all talking about just in this room, probably, 
if they're all developed, um, that will be stored short by 2030 or 2035. And so we really do have to continue that investment. And the DOE funding is, is sometimes the only way that we can drill the stratigraphic wells that are still needed, or the only way that we can put together the class six permits. And so, you know, it's, it's the right project, but it's definitely has a continued role to play. No worries, thanks for confirming that. Um, well, let's go back to business models because I know that everyone in this room is probably very interested in hearing your perspectives on business models uh, for CCS projects and from where you're sitting, what types of CCS project business models are looking financeable right now? Um, and what are, the, what are the challenges and concerns that you're dealing with right now in real time or positive developments? And what are some things that you hope to see evolve or gaps that you would like to see close? Um, it, you know, in the next 12 months. Jan, do you want to start? Yeah, this is a hard one. Big question, I know. <laughs> Just start yeah, out of a lot in there that made it really hard. <laughs> um, you know, and so, you know, so I think from an investment perspective, you know, we, we want projects that have, you know, firm commitments from our customers <laughs> for a long time and a class six permit in place and, you know, SPE, assessed storage capacity. And so we basically want all the risk address, but, but in reality, you know, these, the business models are very, very project and customer specific because there's a lot of options on the menu right now. And, and you know, what worked for the EMP business doesn't directly apply to the CCS business. Mm -hmm. You know, and so then you look at the midstream business model and that works for some customers, but not all. And then you, you know, you, so then you go to other industries, you look at solar renewables and, and how the tax credit monetization and tax equity investments help. And so it's really going to be different business models for different customers, at least right now. And then um, and then even for the investors, it's going to be different investment models. And I think that we have to be, you know, nimble and creative as project developers to, to really develop the good projects, but allow the flexibility for the, these projects to get fully connected across that value chain from sink to source. So it's a challenge. Agree your perspective? Yeah, no, I I, I want to echo a lot of, of what, what Jan said. I, I think it really all depends on, on our customers, uh, on our emitter customers. And um, there are a wealth of, of different uh, options, uh, a wealth of different business models out there. And we've put a lot of effort into building in the flexibility in our team to, to address a lot of those different business model options. Um, and to give an example of some of that range, uh, so our, our, one of our first announcements or project in Louisiana with, uh, with CF Industries um, is, I think, fairly straightforward as far as these projects go. They are handling the capture. They are delivering CO2 at their fence line. Our project is picking it up and putting it in storage and keeping it there. Right, so that's a very simple, you know, point to point, um, you know, direct uh, contract with um, with our customer and and giving them the service they need. Uh, we have other customers who are um, reaching out to us and say, we want a turnkey solution. We don't want to think about anything. You can come on our fence line. You can build the capture equipment. Um, in some cases, they want you to handle the 45Q administration themselves because they also don't want to deal with that or they may not have the tax capacity to deal with that. And then we also take that all the way down to sequestration. Uh, so that is a much more complex uh, commercial negotiation to put in place. Uh, that's certainly a much more complex project uh, to put in place. Uh, we, uh, we also announced earlier this year a partnership with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in part to, to, um, to, to uh, ensure that we can demonstrate you know, kind of uh, that, that full end-to-end -end solution from inside the fence line all the way down to sequestration. Um, but, but that's a very different type of business model that we also want to make sure that we can, that we, that we can engage with. So uh, I think there's a range, but, but it, really, um, it really depends on, on our customer and, and we're making a, a real effort to, to be responsive to those needs. Mike, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, as a financier, somewhat agnostic on exactly what the business model looks like, but, you know, every business model that's going to be successful has the same fundamental building blocks, which 
boils down to positive cash flow. Um, and and, and, and that, that sounds like an easy thing to say, but the, we need to bear in mind that the, the context of CCS within the whole ecosystem. So you may have a sequestration and storage contract that has by itself strong economics, but if the, the emitter of that CCS is not strong or is not well positioned in its industry such that question mark over how long the emissions will be there for, the whole CCS part falls apart too. And as we are you know, focused on areas of the industry where we can have the most impact, tends to be bilateral storage sink, at least as a starting point type projects, we are, we are often facing a single counterparty as a source of CO2 and the source of effectively all of our revenue as being, you know, who's going to deliver the cash flow for the seven to 12 years it takes to, um, to, to pay back a project finance, give a, an, a, an infrastructure investor a return. Like that, that is not an insignificant time period of risk that, that, needs, to be, um, that needs to be considered. Okay, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I guess I'd just say sitting in the middle of people on all sides of this business model, you know, we've got the companies who have an emissions challenge that they're trying to solve. And we have the companies who are trying to build a viable long-term CCUS business. And so I think one of the roles that we try to play is a bit of that matchmaking and helping to connect um, those that have identified an opportunity or identified an emission source that they need to tackle with and with organizations who can help them think about, you know, at what point in the business model are you looking for a partner and how do we get the right partners in the room talking to each other to help sort of facilitate the building of these business models? Because I, I do think, you know, each company is coming at this from a very different direction mm -hmm. uh, in terms of where your expertise is, where you want to sit in the value chain. Um, but having the flexibility to think about, you know, adjusting that business model as appropriate, I think will will create a lot more flexibility um, and, and really helping uh, working with a broad range of industries. We're seeing more and more. Um, this isn't just an oil and gas conversation anymore. This is very much a conversation with glass manufacturers, cement manufacturers and and um, uh, uh, and others who have high high emitting industries. And so bringing them into the conversation and, and helping them think about what those business models could look like as well uh, can really help drive uh, the, the financing opportunities forward. Yeah, and so just to kind of build on a few things you guys said, I mean, we know that the large projects and large hubs can have potential through massive amounts of CO2, but I think the layer there, the challenge is you end up with multiple counterparties and you have issues with timing and it's not as straightforward as a bilateral project. Can anyone expand a little bit more on just some of those some of those challenges? Maybe maybe Jan or Mike. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I mean, it, it's it's really just the dilemma is is that you've got this big storage site, you know, and by you've been almost a, you know, estimating a billion tons of CO two, and then on the other end you have a hundred million tons a year of existing emissions, and then you've got you know, new greenfield projects, a lot of that are being developed as capture ready. And so they're developing their projects. And so, you know, and so it's really about, you know, it's really about timing, right? And so, you know, that the, the infrastructure and the need and the future cash flow is, is coming in Southeast Texas as an example, um, because that's where we have the biggest problem is that's where we're going to have the most active solution space, um, you know, but it's, you know, as you build out your pipeline, you know, then it's, um, you're stacking different specs of CO2, you know, different capabilities of the greenfield project developers and the big corporations with their existing emissions, you know, different investment needs and, and you, you're even stacking some of the financing risk, right? So if, if you have to finance the storage project and you have to finance the pipeline, and then you have to finance a capture source, you know, that also you know, prevent, provides some risk for the investors. And so, so these hubs are challenging. You know? However, I would say that the Gulf Coast in particular where you have the opportunity to build large scale hubs, 
within close proximity, you know, very close to existing emissions does help you de-risk it. So you're not having to build pipelines across multiple states because, you know, we talk a lot about class six wells, but pipelines are hard and, and the panel before us talked about that. So, you know, so I really think that, um, you know, these large hubs provide a big benefit and, you know, having the right teams develop these hubs is going to be important. And, you know, we shouldn't look at it as a big competitive opportunity. We should look at it as we need to be collaborating between private and public and governments and big corporations, because it's going to take all of us together to really pull off a hub like that. Yeah, and I, I think um, all the challenges um, you outlined are, are part of the reason why we're, we're focused on the slightly smaller bilateral type projects where CO2 is being disposed of within a reasonably close proximity of, of where it's being captured somewhat mitigates a lot of those risks. Um, you know, I can put both hats on, I can put my, my debt hat on, and, and when I put my debt hat on, like substantially all the hard work's been done and all the heavy lifting. Don't point at me the... when you talk about debt. <laughs> I'm talking about you as doing the hard work, Jack. <laughs> done all the hard work and like you know when you show up to do the ribbon cutting and put the dead in place um but the the hard work is really before that and, yeah. and that's when you know be it be it um uh project type uh, development debt it's, it's really an equity risk uh, and where we where we're looking to take that risk you know there are two factors that go into returns one of them is you know how much money comes out the other side of it but the other one is how long it takes and and, and we certainly are cognizant that the, the bigger the project get the longer it takes and, and the more moving pieces that can frankly just derail a project. Um, and hence, you know, idea for at least our equity is that we start smaller, uh, build out smaller bilateral projects, shorter time scale, more certainty of getting to cash flow uh, and, and kind of work up from there. But, you know, very keen to see that the hub type developments be successful too. Like this is not an either or thing. You want to add something, Oakley? Yeah, I think the this space is going to develop in fits and starts, right? I mean, I think we're, we're certainly had, you know, we've had a, a very strong, you know, past 12 months as far as the pace of development in this space. I think um, there's certainly a lot of uh, positive signs out there that are going to point towards, um, you know, improved uh, development, but, but it is, you know, there are going to be, there are going to be bumps along the way and there are going to be, um, you know, challenges with regulatory challenges, you know, that, 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 you know, developers and financiers are all going to have to respond to. Um, and, and so, you know, what we've done is, is, or we want to do is, is give our, our customers comfort that, that they're not being unduly exposed to that risk. I think that's one thing, um, you know, I, I've talked about balance sheet funding before and kind of equity funding before, because, this absolutely is equity risk and and our customers take comfort from the fact that you know where you know we have enough capital that's dedicated to their projects and seeing it through some of these unevenness that we're not exposing them to to any of these kind of market risk any of these kind of risks that we can kind of weather some of that on our own uh, without being reliant on external financing so um so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's certainly it's certainly right that that um, you know developing the hub concept is going to help mitigate those risks. Putting shared infrastructure in place, you know, repurposing existing infrastructure where that makes sense. Those are all aspects of that that will help mitigate some of these uh, potential challenges along the way. Um, but but yeah, those we're we're definitely very conscious of those. No, thanks for that. And that kind of leads to our next question because Mike touched a little bit on the macro factors earlier, but. When we think about multiple large projects deploying hub getting built, I mean, you're going to potentially see um, competition, right, in the in the in the local and regional labor market and supply chains, and you know, I just would love to hear your perspective on how how we're going to manage that potential competition in the workforce and supply chain space, and what kind of assumptions do you make in your project financing model, you know, to account for that. Um, Jane, I know you guys are working on that. Maybe you can comment first. Yeah, absolutely, happy to. Um, you know, I, I do think we've got a number of things happening in Texas and, and in the Houston market. You know, we've got hubs that are being developed, um, but we also have individual projects. And so there's a recognition that we're probably going to need a combination of both. And I go back in my mind to the NPC study and debates that we would have for hours about whether we should be trying to build farm to market roads um, <laughs> And, and, and have some sort of more efficient structure and approach for the infrastructure needed uh, for CCUS projects, or do you just make sure there's enough money in the system that pipelines will get built uh, 
project by project. And so we're uh, working closely with the Houston CCS Alliance and University of Houston right now to undertake an infrastructure study to really understand if all of these projects start going, um, how do we make sure we're actually going to be able to have enough workers to work the construction? Um, we're gonna be able to get enough right-of-ways to put in the infrastructure um, that we understand what the water implications, what the power implications will be uh, as these projects start to, to be developed. And, and what are the, the specific supply chain issues when you think about steel and pipe and things like that? Um, you know, how do we, think about those things in the context of Houston's projects and, and position ourselves to, to mitigate those risks um, before, they, before they're in our laps. And so um, we're really excited. To, we've just kicked off that study and expect to have that uh, at the end of the summer um, with the University of Houston to, to really understand where, where do we need to be focusing our efforts to make sure that we've got the right resources in place so that once we, we get everything that we've asked for, we don't run the risk of actually not being able to deliver, um, which I think would probably be the worst case scenario for all of us. Well, I, um, I don't know if there's any other comment on that, but if not, I wanna remind the audience that we're gonna be going to Q&A very soon. And um, in fact, and so before we do that, if I could just get a quick thought from each of you on, you know, basically, What's missing um, from the finance standpoint? What dots do we need to connect to get finance ready to, to push these projects through to scale to give us our 10X, 100X um, build out that we're looking for? So yeah, if I could just get a quick thought from each of you on that, um, what's it gonna take to get CCS fully scaled, uh, fully funded from the finance perspective? Mike, quick thought. Uh, what, what's it gonna take? Look, I mean, I think, I think you know, we're not far away from it. I think we need the investable projects and, and I would encourage anyone who's kind of listening to me talk and says, hey, my project sounds like that. Like, come and speak to us. Like, we are, we are ready. Like, we are, we are ready as an industry and I know I have a bunch of, uh, of peers in other banks who are also ready. Like, we are ready. But be, be, be honest about the risks in your projects. Like, when we're talking about doing first-of-a-kind projects, there are, there are uncertainties, there are risks. These, these, these projects are particularly... Uh, exposed to capital overrun risk. So we need to be honest about managing that, having, having agreements and returns with investors that are commensurate with that risk. But, it, but I, I would say the industry, as a finance industry, is ready. So bring it, like bring the project. <laughs> like we, are, we, are, we are ready. And, and we understand everything is not going to be perfect to start with. Um, you know, Exxon has the, the luxury of, of making everything buttoned up nicely. We understand more junior project developers don't have that, that luxury, but, but come to us early because often we can do things in the structure to help out or we can suggest how it needs to look to, to, to incentivize investors. And, and there may not be enough dollars to say, I'm gonna pay you a greater return, but that there are other things you can do. If you're a, a developer of projects with a pipeline of projects, show that pipeline. It's like, hey, you guys fund the first one, you get a right of first refusal on three more. Everyone knows this is a, is, is a massive opportunity. But that does, that does give financiers somewhat of a luxury to sit back and say, well, do I need to be the first one involved in the first project? Maybe not, let's just wait and see how that goes and then I'll be you know, leading the charge on the second. We need, to, we need to be there on the first, the first one needs to get going. So, so, so bring us there, share the risk, share the reward. And, and I think the industry is, is ready to move forward now, which, which is a very different thing to what I said last year, which was like, I don't know how this is all gonna work. <laughs> so, so I'm very positive is what I want you to take away. Uh, any quick thoughts from anyone else before we just jump into Q&A? Yeah, maybe just, you know, from a project development perspective on, you know, how do we, you know, where are we and how do we really get these projects to the finish line of, of actually injecting the CO2, you know, and so we, we don't look at it as that the financing is going to come from one source. And so then it's really, you know, having the flexibility and and having the capabilities in your development teams to where they identify, you know, not only the right storage and the right customers, but also the right financing to fit that phase of the life cycle. And, and it is gonna come from different sources. And, you know, then we heard some of the policy team talking, panel talking earlier about, you know, tax credits and what, can, what are the states doing and, you know, what's the federal government. And so, you know, and, and then we have private investors that are really hungry for these projects and we have institutional investors that, 
you know, want them for the long term outlook. And, and so I think it's really just us, you know, really working hard and bringing together capabilities across multiple industries to come up with financing solutions and projects that are development and investment ready. So we'll continue to do that. Oakley, any final thoughts from you? No, I think, um, you know, policy is, has been obviously a first step here. The IRA was, it was a huge transformational event to, to get this going. I think the, the regulatory framework to support that policy is going to be very important to get us to the next stage uh, of the process. I think ultimately, if we're getting that 10x, 100x level, um, you know, we need to see a true price on carbon, kind of a market-wide price on carbon. I think that's what's going to enable other projects. For us, CCS is a linchpin to a lot of other um, you know, low carbon technology. So for hydrogen, low carbon ammonia, uh, for negative emissions technologies like DAC, like bioenergy with CCS. Um, but you need that kind of infrastructure in place uh, first, and then you need that price of carbon to, to, to run across all of those other technologies as well. Jane, any thoughts? I would agree 100% with that. I think okay. the, the faster we can get to that level of a, a defined price that, that people can have certainty around and really um, be able to, to develop a, a project around, I think that will make things move a lot faster at scale. Okay. Well, that was a great discussion, guys. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to the questions now. Um, you guys can see them here on the monitor, and I'll just start with the first one. Um, how are investors seeing opportunities, challenges, beyond the 12 years that are in 45Q right now. Any comment on that? I, th I think you can put on two different hats. Again, if I put my debt hat on, it's very hard to look beyond that. So we're looking for projects that fundamentally get repaid within that time period. I think, you know, you skip forward 12 years and I put my equity hat on, it's like maybe I want some base level of, of equity return, but also to the differentiated product point, like. Am I going to have some kind of competitive advantage because I have a low carbon intensity product, whatever that may be, in 12 years time? That seems like a reasonable equity assumption to me. Like exactly how we're going to price that, I don't know, but, but it's reasonable to assume there's a value enhancement there. So, so there is a return, but, but is it one that you're going to get a cash flow debt financier to lend against? Not at this stage, unless you can lock it in somehow. I mean, and, and when we develop these projects, we also, you know, we have to make sure that they're commercial, that they're able, we're able to commercialize them and that we're able to get the cash flows to support the investment. And so, you know, so we take a similar approach and say, you know, over the 12 years, you know, can we, is that as a base case, can we break even with, you know, simple tolling fee type models? And is the price that we would have to charge for this storage site a reasonable price? for the customers to have to pay because they've got a big capture investment ahead of them. Um, and, then we, and then we look at upsides around emerging carbon markets and voluntary credits and, and working in DOE funding or you know, low cost loan office, you know, low cost debt. And so, um, you know, but a lot of the customer discussions that we're having on these big storage sites is not is not just about the 12 years you know they're also taking a long-term view and they're saying today my customers are asking me for these low carbon products and so it's not like 12 years from now we're gonna stop asking <laughs> and you know and, and so and some of it is also up to us as consumers is you know there's still this disconnect in the economics about you know where the cost of decarbonization sits. Is it, does it sit with the project developers? Does it sit with the industrial facility owners and the industrial developers? Or does it sit with the customers, you know, each of us? And so, you know, there's a lot to be worked out, but I think that we're, a lot of investors and customers are taking a long-term view and, and as are we as project developers. So. All right, well, let's move on to the next one. What about um, the management of liabilities with insurance instruments? How, how are those being utilized? I'm assuming that's probably mostly around storage liability. Anyone comment on that? Well, so we have within HEDI a capital formation working committee where we bring together the investment community to really talk about energy transition investment and challenges and hurdles. And I think there's been a lot of work recently um, across the, the finance industry to really understand what the potential tools can be 
to help mitigate that risk uh, and at least understand the financial value of that risk and, and, uh, and put insurance instruments around it. So I expect to see that there's going to be a, a growing um, industry around insurance um, once there's enough modeling out there and enough projects that you can get confidence that there's um, a, a financial value that can be assigned to these long-term liability risks. Um, much like a lot of other things in the oil and gas industry, um, once the, you do enough of them and you know roughly how much the, the, the risk is going to be, you can, you can put a dollar amount to it and um, eliminate the uncertainty. So I suspect that that will be a growing market. Um, and there's been a lot of interest, I know, within the, the finance community that we engage with. I think uh, someone made the point earlier about the importance of science and i think you know we may look like a finance community and like let, let's insure it and, and it goes away like our first defense is the same as industry's first defense it's solid technical work like we don't expect this to be an issue and, and we insure it because it's a low probability but you know potentially expensive event so it, for sure the insurance market is there it, it, it ensures substantially similar liabilities all over the place um not concerned that that if that's required it won't be available it will but Insurance is no substitute for like really well engineered projects. <clears throat> well, let's move on to the question about um, Bayou Bend. It's offshore, and how do the, those economics compare to onshore CCS? You want to address that, Dan? Yeah, and so you know, <laughs> I I personally believe that Bayou Bend will kind of go down in history as the lowest cost storage site that's ever to be developed, but. We'll see longer term if that plays out to be true, but I'll go ahead and make that prediction for you guys. <laughs> and so, you know, but when we look at, you know, the offshore compared to the onshore, in the offshore, the wells are more expensive. They're not multipliers more expensive, they're just a little bit more expensive. You know, maybe 15, 20 million dollars a well in the state waters. And as you go deeper, of course, those well costs will go up. And but the pipeline costs and facility costs for offshore is is less than what we see onshore. So when you when you get into the onshore, you have multiple landowners, you have roads that you have to build, you have well pads and facility pads, and then you also have pipelines. And the onshore pipelines are getting very expensive. And I think that you know when you compare an onshore and an offshore of similar scope, that I think that they'll play out to be similar costs on a dollar per ton basis. And you know, I think that's what's really important for these opportunities is for us to you know, start as close to the emissions and the new projects that are being built as we can to, to try to keep the pipeline costs from day one, you know, the things that you have to have in place for these large hubs. You know, we're not gonna have 100 miles of pipe and 20 wells to start with, with 20 different emission sources. We're gonna start with a couple of wells and a couple of sources and a small, smaller pipeline and that pipeline will grow over time. And so, you know, so I don't think you'll see there's a big cost difference. There's a big social discussion going on about onshore versus offshore. And it's interesting in Europe, we wanna go all offshore in the US. Every, We've done so much DOE work in the onshore that people are really comfortable with the onshore. But from a cost perspective, I think that we've got the wrong conversation. You know, but I, I do think that the offshore is an important, um, it's an important area that needs to be developed and it's gonna play out, I think, to be similar cost. Thanks for that. Um, we have about five more minutes left in the Q&A and I think these next two questions um, should be interesting. What about CO2 utilization? Um, where, where do people see that on the horizon? Is it, is it part of the conversation right now? Um, or, I mean, I guess we're making blue products. It's certainly part of the conversation, but we'd just love to hear your perspective on how you see that fitting into the ecosystem. We're seeing a lot of interest in Houston, particularly with e-fuels uh, business opportunities. And so uh, the idea of, of being able to be an off-taker for CO2 to create methanol, um, there's been significant interest in a couple of projects in development. And so I think, again, the volume that we need to abate right now is so large that we, we absolutely have to do um, 
CCS, but I think there is a growing market for um, CO2 as a feedstock for different uh, different business models. And so I think, um, you know, in, in Houston, if there's an opportunity to make money on something, people are going to figure it out. That's so right. <laughs> we're always really excited when they come up with a new way of, uh, of, of monetizing uh, something like CO2. Yeah. So. Oakley or Jan, any comments on that? I, I would echo that. I mean, I think we're, we're obviously looking at all, on all of, um, the ways to manage CO2, including utilization. Um, and so that's something that it, I think it's probably further down um, the, the line right now. But we are actively looking at opportunities, looking at places, ways to partner with people who are focused on utilization to actually enable those, uh, those technologies as well. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, from a customer perspective for our projects that we're developing, you know, the utilization comes into play a lot, but you know, Alex and I, when we built Carbonvert, we really are focusing on geological sequestration, which is our skill. But, but where this utilization is coming into the conversation is we have some greenfield project developers who want to bring their projects at, like at a demonstration scale on earlier than what you know the storage site will be available. And so ultimately they want to go to geological sequestration, but they're wondering if if there's a utilization opportunity for them in the Houston area that would be a gap filler between their interest in starting their projects earlier and until the geological sequestration. And so, so if you have anything like that, let us know. And we'll, <laughs> we'll connect you with those customers. But I, but I do think there's still a lot of interest in it. It's just that it's not seen to be on a, a big enough scale to what we ultimately need to achieve. Well, let's talk about small emitters because we have talked a lot about large emission sources, large hubs. When do we think that the small emitters are, are going to come into the picture, the ones that aren't enabled, as the question suggests, to manage that uncertainty and permitting, lack of pipeline, et cetera? Where do we see the small emitters coming into the, into the ecosystem? So I have two answers to that. One is this speaks to the importance of, of the development of that hub. Um, concept again, where you know you're going to need some of these large emitters to anchor um, the storage sites, to anchor the transportation infrastructure, especially if you need to build new infrastructure around it. And so um, you do that because that enables uh, some of the smaller operators that are in that same area to take advantage of that shared infrastructure at, at a, hopefully a lower price point. Uh, so that's that's one answer. I think the second uh, goes back to something I said earlier around flexibility on business models, right? I think this, you know, a lot of customers like these are prime customers for us, um, you know, for the the model where we provide that end to end solution right where you know that we're not kind of requiring them to necessarily to make the large investments up front on capture you know that can be all part of one offering for you know that that, that we provide them um, again i think that that only that that works best or that's most economical when it is part of that hub um, but you know but i think there are certainly going to be certain emitters we're seeing that even with large emitters that there's some that are saying hey we're not prepared to make large investments right now in capture can you you know can you be that solution for us um, so i think we certainly want to talk to 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 customers like this some of these smaller emitters who are saying we don't want to take a lot of these un uncertainty we're not prepared to take this a certain risk. Um, can that be part of what you offer us? Mike, is this part of some of the bilateral projects you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think I think maybe um, I'm not exactly sure how small uh, this is contemplating, but but I think the threshold in the right location for a project to be economic might be lower than people think, and so I would I would encourage you to to team up with a with a developer and 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 see you know really what they think. Can be done because we're seeing economic projects that are that are really quite small, um, particularly if you are able to get rid. You know, you can keep your footprint small. You don't have a lot of permitting. You don't have a lot of transport. Um, th those are real opportunities. The other thing I would say is if you're not at that critical mass, like it needs people to people have to move, and so you have to engage in those MOUs. You have to understand that there's going to be some uncertainty on what the commercial terms look like until there's enough critical mass to bring a project forward. If there's too many people hanging out saying, well, I want to see if I can get better terms elsewhere, then kind of we get no progress. Um, so, so that's how I would think about those challenges. Jan or Jane, any final thoughts to add? I mean, I think the small operators are important for us. And I think Oku articulated really well that as we build out this infrastructure, to the extent that they're close to them, they'll be able to you know, tag into it. Um, but, you know, Alex and I are also doing some work around, you know, aggregating some of the smaller greenfield projects together 
to create enough volume that it, it really makes an impact. And so, you know, and so that's back to, we have to collaborate and, and work as a community, work together to really make this happen because of what we really need to achieve. And, you know, and we talked about the, with the policy group on what we really need to achieve is just gigaton scale. And we, we just can't get there without, you know, kind of all of us working together <laughs> and all of these projects being moving forward, so. I think that's a great final thought, Jane, unless yeah. you have anything, no. no? All right, well, thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their insights. <laughs> <laughs>